Let's take a look at some problems that deal with that deal with mass spectrometry. So we'll start with question number one, and it says, which of the mass over charge values corresponds to the base peak in the following mass spectrum? Well, hopefully you remember that the base peak is the tallest. It is the tallest peak in a mass spectrum, and it is given an intensity or a relative intensity of 100%. So it is the peak that has 100% intensity or the tallest peak. And you can see that it comes right below 30 and that it's above 20. And the only choice from these numbers that would be in that range would be 29, which is C. So that is our base peak. Question number two asks us, which of the mass over charge values corresponds to the molecular ion in the following mass spectrum? And we only see four peaks in this mass spectrum. And this peak and this peak must be from fragmentation. And you see this little tiny peak over here, there. And that is probably from an isotope. So that is at 45. And therefore, our parent or our molecular ion peak is this one here at 44. The next question asks us to calculate the degrees of unsaturation for C14, H14, N2O. So degrees of unsaturation, we call this U for unsaturation, or sometimes we call it the HDI, the hydrogen deficiency index. And the way to calculate that is one half times two times the number of carbons plus two plus the number of nitrogens, subtract the number of hydrogens, oops, subtract, subtract the number of hydrogens and subtract the number of halogens. And so if we just plug our numbers in here, we have um, 14 carbon, so that's going to be 28 plus 2 plus 2 minus 14 minus 0 because we have no halogens. And when we punch that in our calculator, we get an HDI, an HDI equal to 9. So our HDI is 9. Question number 4 asks us to do the same thing as in question 3. So I'm going to use the same formula that I have up here to calculate my HDI for C9H11N. And so I can write down that my HDI is going to be equal to 1 half times 2 times the number of carbons, which is 9. So that's 18 plus 2 plus 1 minus 11. And I have no halogens. And when I punch all of that in my calculator, I get 1 half times 10, which is equal to 5. And therefore, my HDI is equal to 5 in this case. The next question says, which of the mass over charge values correspond to the molecular ion for the following compound? So what we need to do is we need to calculate the molar mass of this compound using the masses that I showed you in our, in our lectures. So the molecular formula of this compound is C6H14O. And so for carbon, we use a mass of 12. For hydrogen, we use a mass of 1, again, because this is low-resolution mass spectrometry that we're dealing with. And then finally, for oxygen, we use a mass of 16. And so when we tally all that up, we get 72, 14, and 16. And when we put that all together, we get, we get 102. It definitely can't be 103, right? Because that would mean that there would be nitrogen in the molecule. And so our molecular ion for this compound is going to be 102. The next question asks us, number six, which of the following compounds will have an odd mass over charge value for a molecular ion? And this is based off of the nitrogen rule. The nitrogen, the nitrogen rule is that an odd mass, if we have an odd mass, it's going to mean we have a odd, an odd number of nitrogens in our molecule. The first molecule has no nitrogens. The second molecule has one nitrogen. One is an odd number. And so number two is a possibility. Number three has two nitrogens. But remember, in order to have an odd mass, you have to have an odd number of nitrogens. And two is an even number. And the last one has no nitrogens. So we can cancel out three and four. And so our answer must be two only because that molecule has one nitrogen and one is an odd number. Question number seven asks us, which of the following mass spectra shows the presence of bromine in a compound? And you might remember that bromine has 
two isotopes, we have bromine 79 and we have bromine bromine 81. And of course, they differ in the number of neutrons in the atom. And we talked about the relative abundance of these two isotopes, which is almost roughly one to one, a one to one ratio for our molecular ion, for our molecular ion and our M plus two um, isotope. So we should see two signals or two peaks in the mass spectrum that are relatively or relatively close in intensity. And if you take a look at number one, you can see that I have two signals up here that are about in a one to one ratio. I do not see that in the second spectrum. I don't see it in the third spectrum and I don't see it in the fourth spectrum. And so the answer must be the first spectrum. So our answer is a in this case. The next question asks us which of the following compounds down here is consistent with the mass spectrum below. And you can see that we have a molecular ion right here. This is our molecular ion. And if you look at the mass, we have 70, 71, 72, 73. So it has a mass of 73. And therefore, we can conclude it has an odd number of nitrogens. Now we can solve this question very quickly because D is the only compound with any nitrogens in it and it happens to have an odd number of nitrogens which is one nitrogen. But I thought it might be interesting to take a look at a couple other of the peaks in the mass spectrum, namely this one here at 58. There's one here at 58, so it goes 60, 59, 58. And then there's another one here at 44, which I thought might be interesting to look at. And the signal or the peak that we see at 58, if you take 73 and you subtract 58 from it, this peak comes from the loss of 15. And you might remember that a 15 is the mass of a methyl radical. So this signal at 58 would come from the loss of a methyl radical. And the peak that we see at 44, if we go from 73 to 44, that's a loss of 29 mass units. So we could put here M minus 29. And you probably remember me saying that 29 is the result of a loss of an ethyl radical. Question number 10 asks us, which one of the following compounds is consistent with the mass spectrum below. And we can see that we have our molecular ion here. This is our molecular ion, which is equal to 72. And if we look at these possible structures, I've gone ahead and calculated um, the atomic or sorry, the molecular weight. I've gone ahead and calculated the molecular weights. And the molecular formula of the first one, A, would be C5H12, and that would be 72. So that's a possibility. If you go to B, the molecular formula is C4H10O, which equals 74, and so that can't be the answer. If we look at C, it has the same molecular formula as B, which would also equal 74, so that's an impossibility. And then D has one nitrogen in it, and so this would have an odd mass. Our molecular ion would have an odd mass. And so the answer is A, the compound with a mass of 72. If we go ahead and draw the bond line structure of that compound, so A is 2-methylbutane, so I've drawn the structure here, 2-methylbutane. Two methyl, two if you think about you know, possible fragments that you could get from this molecule, you can see that we have a big peak at 57 here, so we have a big peak at 57, and that would be the result of the loss of 15, so this is M minus 15, and that would be the loss of a methyl group. And what's interesting is if you were to lose that methyl group, okay, you would end up with a secondary carbocation, right, if you lost the methyl radical. And a secondary carbocation would be more stable than if we were to lose anything else in this molecule that would produce a primary carbocation. Question number 11 asks us which one of the following compounds is consistent with the mass spectrum below. You can see we have our molecular ion here, our molecular ion, and it's equal to 101. So we have 100 here. This is 101, 102, 103, 104, 105, right? So this is 101. So that's kind of a giveaway 
since it's got an odd mass, so odd mass means we have an odd, odd number of nitrogens, and the only possibility here would be D. But let's take a look at the fragments just for fun. So if we draw out the bond line structure um, of D, so let's draw that out. It's a secondary amine, and let's draw it like this, okay? Well, you can imagine that if I was to subject that to a high energy beam of electrons, that I could remove one of those electrons to form a, a cation like this. And what's gonna happen is that this is going to undergo alpha cleavage, like we looked at in our book. So this is an alpha carbon here. And so my cleavage is going to occur right there. You don't, you don't even have to know the mechanism, but you know that you're gonna end up losing ethyl, and ethyl weighs 29. And so if we look for 101 minus 29, we get 72. And lo and behold, we have a big peak here at 72, which is M minus 29. And so this is the result of alpha, of alpha cleavage of this molecule. Let's get into some infrared spectroscopy for a minute here. And if you look at question number 12, it says deduce the structure of this compound. It's a pretty, must be a small molecule, C3, H3Cl. I'm not going to put in the formula, but I've already gone ahead and I've calculated the HDI of this molecule, C3H3Cl, and it is equal to 2. So that means I can have a ring and a double bond, two double bonds, or a triple bond, um, or a ring and a double bond, if I didn't say that already. Anyhow, but if we take a look at this spectrum, I think the first thing that we should do is draw a line right around 3,000, so where's 3,000? So here we go, 3,000, something like this, okay? So we have our line right around 3,000, and you can see we have a big peak, or a big uh, absorbance right here, which is at around 3,300. And if you look at an alkyne on the chart of, um, of uh, absorption frequencies for the infrared spectrum, you'll see that this absorbance around 3,300 reciprocal centimeters is the result of an sp hybridized carbon hydrogen bond, which we would only find in an alkyne. So that tells us that this molecule must be some kind of alkyne. Also, alkynes give us carbon-carbon triple bond stretching, or the carbon-carbon triple bond comes around 2,150 or 2,100. And you can see that I have this absorbance here, and it's right around, what, if this is 2,000, if this is 24, okay, say this is around 22, so yeah, it's around 21, 2,150, what do you know? So this is around 2,150 reciprocal centimeters, and again, this is the result of the carbon-carbon triple bond stretch. There's our carbon-carbon triple bond stretch. So when we put that all together, we know that this molecule must have a triple bond, and it must have an sp hybridized bond to hydrogen like that. Well, there's not much else we can do with this molecule except put CH2 and then put a chlorine on the end like that. And that's the final answer. And so we determined that we had an alkyne in the molecule, and we also determined that the alkyne must have had an sp2 hybridized carbon hydrogen bond. And based off of that, we were able to determine the structure of this alkyne. Question number 13 asks us to deduce a possible structure for the following compound. Again, I've gone ahead and I've calculated the HDI for C7H8O, and it has an HDI, it has an HDI equal to four. And something else that I noticed right away in this molecule is in between around 1450, so around 1450 to 1600, I see these absorbances here, and I also see some overtones right here. And that tells me that these stretches between 1450 and 1600 are carbon-carbon double bond stretching, but it's the result of an aromatic, an aromatic ring. So again, for an aromatic ring, we usually see two to three absorbances in the region of 1450 to 1600, and oftentimes we also see these overtones, which are between 1600 and 67 reciprocal centimeters and 2000 reciprocal centimeters, so right around here, so the overtones, okay? And we could even 
write those in here, the over, the overtone. So immediately we know that we have this. We know that we have an aromatic ring. Now you've probably also noticed right away that we have this big stretch here um, in the range between around 3,200 and 3,600 reciprocal centimeters. And that is the result of an oxygen-hydrogen stretch of, of an alcohol. All right, so this comes from an alcohol, an alcohol. And we also see a carbon-oxygen stretch for our alcohol, which usually comes between 1,000 and 1,250. So here's, this is 1,000. And then if this is 1,250, something like this, right, probably this, Probably that absorbance right there is the result of the carbon-oxygen bond. Anyhow, we know that we have an aromatic ring and that we have a hydroxyl. So the hydroxyl must be on our aromatic ring. Now, if we tally up what we've got so far, we've got six carbons. We've got used up six carbons. We used up six hydrogens, and we used up an oxygen. But our formula is C7H8O. And so what do we have left over? We have one carbon left over, we have two hydrogens, and we have two hydrogens left over like that. And so you might be wondering, well, could a possible structure, what if I put the CH2 group in between the aromatic ring and my hydroxyl like this? And I would accept that. I would say that is a reasonable structure. But remember, the question says, deduce a possible structure. And I would say that there are other ways to insert this methylene into our molecule. What if, what if we took our aromatic ring and we put our hydroxyl here on it, okay? Why couldn't we have the methyl group next to it like this? There's no reason why this couldn't be a possible structure as well. Again, it's asking us to give a possible structure. Now you might be asking, well, could I have put the methyl group over here like this? Yes, this is also a possible structure. And I'd say there's one more possible structure and that is where I have the methyl group like this, okay? I would say that this is also a possible structure. So I would accept four possible structures here. Now you might be wondering, well, how would I be able to determine, you know, exactly which one of these four it is? In order to do that, you'd have to get into chapter 15 and you'd have, and using NMR spectroscopy, we could determine which one of these isomers is represented in this infrared spectrum. And before the end of this video, I just want to point out one thing that I forgot. If this is 3,200 and this is 2,800 right here, that means that this line right here, this is 3,000 reciprocal centimeters. And if we draw a line straight up here like this, you can see that there's a signal or an absorbance right around here. And that is the result of sp2, hybridized carbon-hydrogen stretching, which is found in all of these molecules, right? Any carbon-hydrogen bond on the aromatic ring is considered an sp2 carbon-hydrogen bond.